Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future Technologies, poised to transform our lives for better or worse, are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used, or just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs, and this is going to be a good one. I'm here in person, and I'm talking to Brian Deary, Chief Scientist at Factum. So why am I talking to him? Are we going to be talking about Factum? No. We're going to be talking about a lot of really interesting things in the Bitcoin universe. Uh, the ASIC boost that's in the news, the block size debate, um, some history of Bitcoin, what Bitcoin actually is. We're going to cover a lot of great material. And the reason why I talked to Brian is uh, Brian's extremely knowledgeable about all things Bitcoin, blockchain, etc. I attend his weekly meetup in Austin, Texas, and I've learned tremendously from him. So that's why I'm here. So, Brian, how you doing? Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. So first thing um, we're going to talk about is um, Bitcoin itself. You told me once uh, a lot of people that are involved in Bitcoin don't even really know what it actually is. And even at the highest levels, uh, people don't really know what it is. Um, it's Bitcoin is different things to different people. Uh, some people see it as a uh, tamper-resistant state transition system. Some pe people see it as a payment network. Some people see it as a time-stamping system. Some people see it as a store of value. Some people even see it as a smart contracting platform. Um, all of these things are valid and are uh, one of the things that Bitcoin might turn into, uh, probably all of them. Um, but uh, pigeonholing it into any one of these particular items is... Uh, pretty much, to me, shows a lack of imagination um, for this incredible resource that's, that's being created. Um, however, a, uh, a large component of, of Bitcoin itself is the money aspect, um, the, right. uh, the future of, of money, or the Internet of Money, as the uh, Bitcoin.com uh, website uh, tells us. Yeah, um, so, so why do you say that a lot of people don't understand it, <clears throat> even at the high level, if everyone has their own idea of it, yeah. And Bitcoin is many things, then where's the misunderstanding here? Well, I mean, it does all these things. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a time stamping system. So if you needed to prove that some data is sufficiently old, you can take that data and insert it into the blockchain and show that it's very old. Um, but at the same time, it's also moved, used for moving money from one spot to the other. Um, and it's also got the, the, the Bitcoin, the token behind it, which has value in it, which people will give up real resources for, um, and all of these things coexist simultaneously. Okay. And saying it's just one of those is um, disingenuous to me, it seems. Oh, okay, okay. So what you're hearing is someone will think Bitcoin's just digital gold, but they're ignoring all these other things it can be. So exactly. Bitcoin is all these things, and maybe people don't even know that it's all these things. Right. Okay, right. gotcha. So... Uh, a large component of, of Bitcoin is the is the money aspect, and um, as uh, we found out that uh, money is is power, and controlling money is something that powerful people will fight over. Um, and we're also finding out that uh, Bitcoin is a political system in and of itself. Uh, we've got different branches of governance. You've got the miners. You've got the software developers. You've got the users, exchanges. Lots of different. Um, parties that need to all cooperate to move this thing forward, and they all have power over each other in certain ways mm. um, and are under the control of power. But this being a, a political system, it, to me, looking into the distant future, it's um, disheartening. So if we're successful uh, and Bitcoin becomes a dominant force in the, uh, in the world, um, Powerful people will try to control it via the nation state. Um, That's true. And uh, this will eventually culminate in shooting wars between different nations, uh, fighting over how to control Bitcoin and Bitcoin network policy. You know, um, do you know anyone that's been killed over Bitcoin? No, no, but um, we do have a few uh, notable uh, people in the space who have. Um, 
are no longer with us. Uh, most notably, uh, Hal Finney is one of the um, one of the very first uh, Bitcoin users, uh, if not the first, after the Satoshi uh, team. But he he passed on uh, a while back. Autumn Radke, um, uh, Dave Kleiman, uh, both uh, Bitcoin Bitcoiners. Um, uh, another uh, one recently that um, has passed on that not a whole lot of people know about. Uh, Maybe some New York City Bitcoiners uh, know about this guy. Jacob Denault. He did a bunch of work for uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, trading uh, derivatives and futures for eight years. Mm. And so big into the Wall Street high finance stuff. And uh, he quit his Wall Street job to work at Factum uh, a few years ago. Oh, wow. And he he bounced around a little while and then eventually landed at uh, working for... Uh, the CNBC TV personality Brian Kelly uh, managing his finances. He was a uh, a very trustworthy individual in this in this space. And uh, his loss about a month ago is a, a big uh, loss to the industry. Um, oh. Now, Hal Finney though might uh, have dodged a bullet. He um, he's preserved by cryonics. Uh, they, really? Yeah. The, he, uh, his head, head or his whole body? His his head is frozen on ice until uh, science can unfreeze him and um, reanimate him and fix his uh, disease that he died of. Huh. Um, but uh, also, uh, kind of a, an odd tie-in of uh, the industry, um, Ralph Merkel of the Merkel tree, the inventor of that, a uh, very prestigious computer scientist. Uh, he's still alive, but uh, he's also very active in the cryonics field. So he has basically said that he wants to be around, and part of the debate when artificial intelligence starts to become a, an important part of society. Very interesting. Hmm. Quick question on um, the fellow that worked with you that came from Wall Street. Yeah. What did you get from his big finance background? Like, what did it bring to Factum, and what did you learn that you didn't know from him? Uh, he was uh, our, our treasurer. Uh, so he managed a lot of the, uh, the finances and a lot of the, the back end money, um, and he uh, that was that was basically his job while, uh, while he was with us. Okay. Any insights into big banks and um, the fiat currency system because of his uh, interactions with you, or why not? Uh, not so much. Uh, not much more than the normal stuff that uh, you hear about. Uh, gets passed around between Bitcoiners from time to time. Okay. Yeah, and before leaving, the, mm-hmm. um, we were anyway, talking about the politics of Bitcoin. I find it ironic that Bitcoin seemingly, in my opinion, was supposed to be this money system that's outside of big government and away from control and, you know, supposedly away from politics, but yet it seems to be one of the most political things around. I find it ironic. I don't know about you. It's very political because we're observing it. So the person out in the street doesn't know anything about the the internal struggles of the, the different branches of Bitcoin. That's true. That's true, yeah. And nor do they care. They just want it to work. Mm. And whatever work means for them. Okay, fair enough. You said that um, as, as Bitcoin continues to grow, that you think powerful yeah. nation states, people, corporations, etc., will want to use it to exert their control. Any scenarios you thought of that you think would be likely because of that? Well, um... I mean, it's it's hard to say. We're 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 learning now that Bitcoin mining itself is the miners have a, a lot of control over how the network um, proceeds, and eventually, I mean, we we learned about this um, vast amounts of electricity have been uh, marshaled in the past for um, national defense purposes, and so lots of uh, rivers were dammed up to uh, enrich uranium back in the in the forties and fifties to basically build nuclear weapons. Hmm. Um, That's right. And so this is basically a way of exerting control. And uh, Bitcoin mining is a a lot more of a direct way of doing that, where you can directly affect by by applying thermodynamic energy. And so if all it takes is tapping into a dam and uh, buying some some mining equipment, uh, then... If that's all it takes to exert control, then sure, why not? That's true. I mean, China could say, we're going to devote um, 5% of the country's energy um, creation to 
to Bitcoin mining, we want to have the most hash power. And they can do that probably almost um, maybe below the level of notice, but they certainly have the resources to do that. And my suspicion is it would be more of a defensive measure. So the people in the, in the, in the country would want to not be subject to the whims of the Chinese government. Uh, so they would advocate for, say, the U.S. government to, to build uh, some mining equipment in order to create this balance of power between the different communities. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Okay. Any other scenarios you see possibly playing out? Well, if diplomacy doesn't work, the old adage of um, war is just diplomacy by another name. Yeah, true. Um, so, I mean, who knows? If, if it's advantageous for one nation to start bombing the mining rigs of another mining nation and to prevent them from doing whatever they're doing. Yeah, or a cyber attack. You know, if they know which, is a lot, which is a lot easier. Yep. but uh, may not send the same message. Hmm. In that vein, though, any um, cyber attacks that you've seen on mining operations? Well, I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, didn't last week we hear about um, one of these mining rigs, uh, mining um, companies get hacked, and some of their hash power was directed to another um, to another pool? Oh, I, think, okay. uh, I think I read about that. Uh, so... Yeah, cyber attacks are definitely going to be a uh, constant thing going forward in the future. Yeah, I just heard today about a botnet that supposedly was going to set up uh, mining on you know all the the bots of the network. Yes, but uh, botnet mining was was kind of a thing way back when, mm. back when CPU mining was a big deal. But it wasn't a very good usage of the botnet, since if so, let's say that your grandma and your computer gets infected, and you're the botnet operator. You have basically two options. One, you can spin her CPU and her CPU fan and slow down her computer and make it really loud and basically make it, and you'd get some tiny bit of Bitcoins, but you'd make it very obvious that her computer's been compromised. Mm. Or you can use it to send emails, and which is probably a bit more profitable, and you get to keep your botnet. Um, so yeah, botnet mining in today's world is uh, totally useless. Okay, good to know. So no, so there's no real scare there. At least for Bitcoin. So there are <clears throat> other uh, mining technologies that are memory hard or um, are optimized for CPUs, which at this point might make sense for botnet to take over and, and attack or uh, provide hash power to that network. Okay. All right. So we talked about current events, future events. Actually, let's, let's look at the past. Very few people seem to do this, you know, I would guess you have some insights into the past of Bitcoin and, you know, how it started. I've, I've done a better research, but um, let's go further in the past. You uh, you know who Adam Smith is, right? In the Invisible Hand. The Invisible Hand guy, yeah. yeah. Um, he was a, a Scottish philosopher, most well known for his book, uh, the, he's got a long title, but The Wealth in Nations is the mm -hmm. name of the book. Right. He also published another book called The, uh, the Theory of Moral Sentiments. Right. which uh, is more about uh, humanity and less about economics. One of, the, one of the theories that he pushed forward was um, that, uh, quote, uh, man naturally desires not only to be loved, but also to be lovely, or to be that thing which is natural and proper object of love. So he's not talking about love in the romantic sense, but rather humans want to be liked or praised for being praiseworthy, not so much for frivolous reasons or just for reputation or marketing or something like that. And you also talked about the opposite was also true. So Satoshi seemed to, to have got it right. He, uh, he returned to the ash before uh, doing something unlovely. <laughs> he left at the high point, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Now, uh, some people who work on the, on the Bitcoin core, may, uh, core, core code have a different opinion. They mainly know him through his uh, rushed coding style, where uh, they're desperately trying to not let the spaghetti of Bitcoin Core un untangle. And uh, but uh, he, there are a few bugs that uh, that he left in in Bitcoin. Uh, there are a couple off by one errors. Um, uh, Opcheck multisig is one of them, where an extra byte needs to be added onto uh, onto the stack in order to uh, get around this bug. 
Do you think these were intentional bugs or just he was rushed and... That's a good question. That's a good question. So probably not. Uh, some of them maybe. So the next one is the, um, uh, the time warp attack. This is probably a bug and an off by one error, but it could be used as leverage of the mining faction, the mining governance branch over the users as to basically do weird things on the network using this bug. So, um, yeah, you know, what does that mean? What is the time warp attack? Maybe in layman's terms. It basically makes it such that the difficulty of mining a block over time can be made a lot easier. Hmm. And so done right, the Bitcoin blocks can come a lot faster. Uh, Vitalik Buterin gave a, uh, an interesting post about this a few months ago, about how uh, the block uh, time could be drastically increased by using this attack. So yeah, what does that mean? Like how, how do you mine a block differently to make it more efficient or faster? It basically, what it does is it, it lowers the difficulty. So what that allows it to do is makes it easier for the industry to find a block. Oh. And so an artificially lower, you can artificially lower the difficulty yeah, yeah. regardless of the current hash rate. Right. Hmm. right. What, how much? Uh, it's, it's slowly over time, but um, I, I don't remember the, the, the particulars of, of how quickly, but it would take months to, to drive the difficulty down to a point where blocks come a lot faster. This sounds kind of like, I guess, a different uh, version of ASIC boost, but I guess we'll get to that. Uh, sure, sure. Um, yeah. one, one of the other bugs was uh, that um, the Merkle trees were built with a, uh, a way to allow duplicates in, in certain circumstances, which can screw up some protocols. And this was a bit of uh, a scare in the early Bitcoin days, but they managed to, uh, to work around that. What, what do you think? I don't. I know that you're not them, but what is the mindset of a Bitcoin core developer? Are they just is Satoshi their god, and they're just they want to keep the code as it was, and they're looking for insights, and, and they just don't don't want to make any changes? I mean, it just seems kind of a strange way that they work. That's a good question. So, I would not like to generalize uh, about a whole group of people that are loosely coupled. Um, I know that a few of the uh, the core developers at least have told Roger Ver that uh, they're not fans of, of uh, Satoshi uh, really? hmm. in, in no uh, uncertain terms. And so part of this might be some of these some of this design uh, that he done early on that they need to live with, and that's all they know him by, or who knows. But <clears throat> some I'm sure are constantly in awe of the foresight. And all the things that uh, are that are in Bitcoin that no one knows about yet, that he has thought about and put in there, and uh, is just waiting for someone to find it. Wait, so how can that be if the code's all known? How could there be things in there that we don't know about yet? Because it's not the code; it's the algorithms. So it's the way that you use it. So going back to this, no one knows what Bitcoin is. Okay. There are lots of things that have yet to be discovered. How do you, why would you think that? Like, what evidence have you seen of that? Because lots of things have been discovered in the past that have kind of come out of the blue, where it's... Uh, Paul, Paul Stortz talks about this, where uh, there's some weird thing in Bitcoin that seems kind of odd until this other piece of information comes into effect and then is um, suddenly makes sense. Huh. You think it's intentional or it's just an emergent property of the algorithm? I don't know. Okay. But your opinion is, there's going to be more of it, possibly quite a bit more. Uh, there's a lot more to be discovered about Bitcoin. And so I, I've heard some people talk about mathematics um, in this way, that uh, people don't invent certain uh, mathematics. What they do is they discover it. Okay. Um, and so uh, some of the things in Bitcoin are, are similar, where you'll discover <laughs> That's, that's pretty interesting. That makes it even more fascinating. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Okay. So smart contracts and Bitcoin are coming down the pipeline. But that's a layer, right? The, the Rootstock team is working on that, RSK? Mm, that's one aspect of it. This has to do with uh, MAST, uh, Merkleized Abstract Syntax Trees. So maybe some of, the, some of the good stuff that Ethereum is developing will be able to be 
backported into Bitcoin, hmm. um, where the Turing completeness is made not terribly important and uh, is basically so. Basically, you would unroll a computer loop for the uh, compiler savvy people in the audience. At which point, you've basically just got a straight program that you're executing, and there's no looping needed for that. Oh, okay. Would that make the program more efficient? Or I mean, a lot of programs run on loops. But. No, it won't make it more efficient. But um, so, in Ethereum, you have something called the gas limit. So this is the limit of how much computation can be done per unit block. But if you don't have loops, and all you do is you execute a program one by one by one by one, then the effective then the gas limit is basically the block size. Hmm. And so, if you can only fit so many instructions into a block, you can only execute so much. And so, I mean, we're, you hear from time to time about uh, people complaining about the uh, raising the gas limit, which right. seem, which is functionally identical to raising the block, limit, block size limit. But um, back to uh, Adam Smith, um, there are a few people who I, uh, I, I deeply respect in Bitcoin, uh, at least in the past, and now I kind of have mixed feelings about them. Really? Tell me about some of them. What happened? What, what did you like that they did? What sure. changed? Yeah. So uh, probably the, the, the biggest example that everyone knows about is uh, Mike Hearn. So back in 2012, when I was trying to convince my family and my friends why I was excited about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. I would send them Mike Hearn's London 2012 conference video. Uh, he talked about things that no one had talked about before. He talked about payment channels, or we know what those are. He talked about smart property. He talked about assurance contracts like Kickstarter. Um, and he even went on to develop uh, Lighthouse to basically implement this thing that he had kind of become famous for. Hmm. And then he tried to implement blacklists in Bitcoin. Uh, he called them red lists, but same thing. And then he tried to become dictator of life, dictator for life of Bitcoin. <laughs> What do you mean blacklists? I mean, um, certain what IPs couldn't buy or sell or transact with Bitcoin? Or? No, basically coin tracking. So um, a way to, to track stolen coins and uh, suspicious activity that was happening on the blockchain and kind of build this into the lowest level and effectively break the fungibility of Bitcoin. Hmm. And so instead of when you get Bitcoins right now, you are fairly assured that you'll be able to spend them later. Right. If there was a blacklist in effect, if someone sent you bitcoins, you would need to check against this blacklist to say to see if you were able to send these coins uh, to someone later. If someone else would take them. Right. Now, this would basically put whoever maintains this blacklist in control of bitcoin. That's true. Yeah. This was kind of a bad precedent to start down. Well, it seems like that's kind of happening anyway. I mean, I've heard that, you know, certain exchanges are able to trade, I mean, to track um, five hops deep or deeper if they wanted to, what happens with a particular, you know, transaction and shut down someone's account if they don't like where it goes or where it came from. And it's scary, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I've heard this from some local Bitcoins traders. Um, they were trying to use Coinbase, for instance, and Coinbase just shut them down and said, hey, you know. We think your coins are involved and in, your transactions are involved in bad areas, you know, with bad actors and a more account. And this is what scares me about Coinbase. Coinbase needs to live in two worlds. They need to live in both the, the new Bitcoin world and they also need to live in the old school, heavily regulated world. Their value proposition, they, they're trying very hard not to get their doors kicked down. Um, right, that's true. Uh, they've got one banking license. If that gets cut off, then they're out of then they're out of luck. Yeah. So they are pursuing compliance with a particular zeal that um, is scary. So part of their sales pitch to the industry is, "Hey, we can catch all these people and we can close all these accounts because Bitcoin is so transparent and so trackable." This is they basically kind of have to do this because they live in this regulated world. Right. Yeah. So eventually we'll get to a point where we won't need to have the coin bases of the world or uh, some of what they do will become obfuscated uh, or um, ob obviated where they, uh, they won't be able to track these coins, at which point 
it's a matter of do they cut off their customers who are trying to have financial privacy or not. So, so that was my current. So I got a couple more. So Jan Moeller was a uh, kind of a special guy. He created the program called Bitcoin Spinner. This was an Android program that um, people would. Uh, this was basically the one of the one of the major Android wallets, uh, and this turned into Mycelium. Hmm. Well, eventually he uh, he left Mycelium and went to work at. Uh, he founded the company called Chainalysis which is one of these Bitcoin tracking companies that does all the blockchain analysis and tries to figure out which coins are going where and not something that uh, I feel comfortable with. Yeah, so again, it's, a, it's someone that was on, quote-unquote, the side of the people and has jumped ship and now is on <clears throat> the side of evil, you could say. Yeah, you could put it that way, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to, but... Uh, well, I'll put it that way, you don't have to. But, yeah. mi- mixed feelings, mixed feelings. Okay. Um, Another guy I have mixed feelings about is uh, Alan Reiner. Alan created the Armory Wallet. This was the most secure wallet. So before you had the Trezor and uh, all these other projects that had separate hardware, you needed to create your own separate hardware. And so what you would do is you would have an old laptop or something like that that would never connect to the Internet, and then you would manage the private keys on this offline computer. This was head and shoulders above what um, any of the other... This was the most secure wallet at the, at the time. Trace Mayer uh, funded his, uh, his, his company and his project, and I, I chipped into his, his fundraiser at one point also. Okay. Um, this, this was an important part of the Bitcoin infrastructure. He started a company around it. The company ended up not doing so well. The, uh, his startup uh, folded. And uh, he basically didn't want to do that anymore. So he went to go work for the former NSA director, Keith Alexander. Really? And his really? company. Yeah. So uh, we have no idea what he's working on now. But it's probably not helping the users. Yeah, it's worrisome because of the knowledge he has in the industry. And then he goes to you know, the NSA. And I'm sure they'd be very interested or growing more interested by the day in you know, what he knew and his expertise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this kind of gets back to where we started, ASIC Boost. Another one of these people who um, I, I deeply respected, Dr. Uh, Timo Hanke. First time I was exposed and, and met uh, Timo, he was giving a speech at the uh, 2013 San Jose Bitcoin Conference. This was uh, one of the, my favorite speeches at the uh, conference that I happened to be in the audience for. And uh, he was doing this really clever thing where he was using elliptic curve homomorphism to be part of a payment system where private keys can be kept offline mm-hmm. and a user can pay basically a seemingly random address to a merchant. And the merchant would, through clever cryptography, be able to spend these bitcoins and they would know that they came from this person and it was cryptographically provable that mm-hmm. this money came from this person for this order. Anyway, so the uh, the speech is still um, online, but uh, I I was basically floored by this. It was nothing I had ever heard of before, and it was uh, spectacular. Well, maybe it's a stupid question, but why would that be useful to have this proxy that can spend your Bitcoin for you instead of you doing it? Uh, so it's it's not so much a proxy. So the problem he was solving was of hacks. So when you are running a, a merchant uh, service business, uh, a merchant, uh, when you're selling things, you have cryptographic private keys that basically say your, um, what you're selling and for how much. And if you wanted to prove this, the, the, the problem comes in with, with hacks. So let's say that this merchant gets hacked. And since it's an online computer, anything that's online can be hacked effectively. If these private keys are stolen, someone can forge invoices mm. and say, hey, this company mm. promised to sell me all these goods for this low, low price, and hey, it's cryptographically signed. By removing that private key from the server, it can't be compromised. And so if someone manages to hack the server, all they can do is they can get basically potential invoices on their price list. And it's up to the purchaser 
to assemble their own invoice together using the published prices. And then that is cryptographically signed by the, by the merchant. Yeah. And then through a clever communication mechanism, the, the money is delivered. The ability to spend the money is delivered to the merchant through clever ECDSA math. Okay. Uh, you kind of have to watch the video a few times to, to get it. You know, more of the premise now, but yeah. okay. Eventually, he, um, he started working for a company called uh, Cointera, which is actually uh, was Austin-based. Um, they were trying to... They, they built a, um, a few ASIC uh, mining equipment, but the competition was a bit too extreme for them, and they folded. Um, yeah. But in, uh, in late 2013, he and another um, uh, prominent Bitcoiner, uh, Sergio Lerner, patented something that would eventually be called um, ASIC Boost. Oh. And uh, the patent was, was hidden kind of for a while, but it really became public about a year ago now, hmm. uh, back in 2016. So this basically would give uh, somewhere around a 20% advantage to whoever was uh, building ASICs this way. But here's the kicker. You don't just get... 20% of the profits, you get all the profits. If you win the, the hash race, yeah. Yeah. So basically what you do is you, by being more efficient, you are making every other mining technology unprofitable. Does this guarantee you to win? If you have enough... There are no guarantees, no. But if you have quote-unquote, well, the more hash rate you have, the more likely it is you're going to win every time? Or how much of a boost does this really give you? What this does is it lowers your costs. So you are able to mine using less electricity. And there are a few other things too. But yeah, non-ASIC boost miners will basically be driven driven out. And So this basically makes me feel a little bit uneasy about this, primarily because it's a, it's a patent-based thing. And the whole purpose of patents mm. are to <clears throat> take profits from the from the consumers effectively and concentrate them in the patent holder. Yes. Yeah, so, so, all right. So this is a patent, even if the patent holder didn't use it for mining by licensing it and making everyone else pay their fees. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're holding hostage, I guess this, this improvement instead of it be, becoming an emergent thing, you know, a new computer chip has been made an ASIC that can mine faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So tell me the history of mining, the abbreviated version. Okay, well, so you you've heard of the uh, the, the ten thousand uh, Bitcoin pizza, right? Yeah, the first transaction ever. Supposedly, yeah. um, that's kind of a bit a misnomer. So there was an exchange rate. There were people trading bitcoins on kind of you can kind of call them exchanges uh, at the time. Okay, uh, but they did have a price, and. So the 10,000 Bitcoins was eh, about 40 bucks, somewhere around there. Wow. Too bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at the point, at the time it was, I mean, I'll tell you some of the perceptions I had. At the time, I thought that this was an experimental system and that they were developing these prototypes. And then eventually, once it became ready enough, they would go to version 1.0 and reset all the coins. Mm. Makes sense, yeah. I hear that a lot from, from all the people I talked to. They first saw Bitcoin years ago. They thought, eh, and they forgot about it. And then a year, two, three years later, whatever it was, all of a sudden they said, wait a minute. And they kicked themselves for not getting involved earlier. It's very common. Yeah. And, uh, and this, I think, is going to be the case for most of humanity. Uh, they're going to hear about it and think that it is a joke and it will go away or fall on its face or get shut down or insert doom here. Yep. Um, and then a few years later, they'll hear about it again. And then a few years later, they'll hear about it again. And eventually, they'll uh, start taking it seriously. I agree. Yep. So 10,000 Bitcoins actually bought two pizzas, not just one. With toppings? Or? <laughs> All kinds of toppings, yeah. Okay. And not just regular pizza, Papa John's pizza, <laughs> the good stuff. But what most people don't know is, how did he get all these Bitcoins in the first place? That's true, yeah. So, That's a lot. Uh, Laszlo was the, uh, was the guy. He pretty much was the first guy to invent GPU mining. 
So this was in uh, uh, April 2010. April? Even, back, even back then they were contemplating GPU mining? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, so he basically went, he was mining, and he basically went from getting one block per hour to one or two blocks an hour. And this is back when Bitcoins were, uh, when you get 50 Bitcoins each block. Wow. So this was a dramatic increase in the um, in the efficiency that he was getting. And something that came out, there was a, a, a private email from Satoshi uh, between him and... Uh, and Satoshi was kind of uh, wringing his hands about um, delaying the... Um, the, the arms race between uh, GPU uh, miners because today and certainly at the time GPU mining was a, a very complicated very uh, sophisticated way of setting up the uh, and doing mining and at that point of Bitcoin's life it was more about spreading the wealth and allowing people to win a few bitcoins to begin with to get them in, uh, invested into the system mm. so basically about a month after he mined a whole bunch of bitcoins he from today's perspective gave them away and so a couple months later in uh, july 2010 the the mid-state optimization came out so this was for cpus and so what this allowed this allowed much more efficient mining uh, the impression i get was satoshi didn't know about this optimization okay. um but uh maybe he did but just didn't bother me a minute what this does is it uh, it breaks up the hashing function into a few operations. So the first thing when you're hashing, it, it's basically three operations. And so this brings it down to one or two, based, uh, depending on, on how you look at it. Um, it. It basically cuts out entirely one of the, uh, one of the operations. Mm. And so it dramatically increases the, the hash power. But that's, this was available to everyone. Uh, since it was on the on the main software, and then uh, a couple years go by with GPUs and FPGAs being introduced into the market, and then uh, about mid 2013, ASIC started coming out. Hmm. A fellow went by the handle uh, Fried Cat. He started a company called ASIC Miner. He didn't have uh, a web page even for his company. He was pretty much just running this off of a Bitcoin talk thread. Huh. Yeah. Uh, he basically started this company because he was afraid that a lot of the other, there were a few other mining companies that were starting around that time, and he was concerned they would get there first, and then instead of selling their product to the public, they would mine for themselves and heavily concentrate the, uh, the mining power yeah. in Bitcoin. So his goal, ostensibly when he started the company, was to be the underdog, be the little guy who eventually got to market and was selling these basic products to, uh, to the masses. Turns out that um, he was not the underdog. He was the guy that pretty much was able to ramp up production first. Um, so that was a nice um, bit of uh, fortuitous um, history in Bitcoin where it stayed uh, decentralized. And so he didn't go to the dark side. He actually did give the technology away. Well, he didn't give it away. No, he sold, sold it. it. He sold it. And there was also a kind of a um, uh, a share based uh, uh, trading system that uh, shares of his company were traded around. There's a whole lot of backstory to that, which mm. we don't need to get into. So all along, all these there have been different advances to um, to ASIC mining, and all of them effectively shut down the previous generation. And so now we get to ASIC Post. Yeah, what's that going to do? That's a good question. So there are two different types of a basic boost. There's the overt version, and there's the covert version. So there's one version where people can tell that you're doing this, or at least have a pretty strong suspicion. And that's because of the order of transactions that no. get put into a block? Or no? no. And then there's the covert version, where it has to do with the the way that the blocks are ordered, the uh, the transactions are ordered. Okay. Um, and this is the one that's more scary and has everyone up in arms. So where are we going with this? The um, Both types of uh, ASIC boost allow you to parallelize mining a little bit. And what that does is um, 
it, it lowers your electricity costs. And another thing that it does is it makes your chips smaller. And smaller chips mean smaller die sizes, which mean more chips per wafer, which means cheaper chips. So Sam Cole of uh, the defunct uh, KNC Miner Mining Company uh, out of Sweden had investigated this in the past. He calculated that he would save about 30% on electricity and 15% on capital costs on, on buying the chips, uh, which is nothing to sneeze at. Just just the, um, the savings in electricity alone makes it a virtuous thing if it was adopted by everybody. Well, that's... Or will the network that's a, adjust I'm to make it harder? I'm glad you said that. Okay. I'm glad you said that. So that is... Not true. There will be no savings of electricity. All this does is it makes it more efficient for a particular miner. So when a, an individual miner uh, makes their operations cheaper, it gives them a dramatic competitive advantage. Right. But like we've seen with the shifts from FPGAs to ASICs and so on, when this is adopted industry-wide, there's not really any specific advantage since all of the profits will be driven out and gone will go to the electricity costs. So electricity costs are the most expensive part of Bitcoin mining. And if you make it such that you're using less electricity per unit computer, then you'll just use more right. miners and spend the same amount of electricity and get the same amount of Bitcoins. Like a cigarette, a light cigarette, you'll just puff on it harder. To get the nicotine. I yes. Or a low flow shower, you'll shower longer to get the water. Or I'll have toilet, to take... you'll flush more. Or... Okay, okay. So this is basically an advancement which is patented at this point. So it's going to be up to the individual miners and the people along the supply chain whether or not they want to pay this licensing fee. Because if they don't so if ASIC boost becomes an industry standard, then not using it will not be profitable and <clears throat> no one will do it. And so then the question becomes, are they going to do it and pay Timo? Or are they going to do it and not pay Timo and try to hide? So some of these operations are large enough that it um, is difficult to hide. But running from Timo might actually be a good thing. <laughs> Why? So the the main benefit of, of Bitcoin is that the control is distributed out to lots of not identifiable parties. So let's say that Timo was actively going out trying to find these uh, mining operations that were violating his patent and was using the, the government to, to help him. Mm. It would now be in miners' interest to, A, try to hide... Uh, they would set up their mining operations in places where it's not easily identifiable. And two, another thing they would do is not identify themselves. So right now, you see all these pretty graphs on on the web pages <coughs> where uh, all the miners talk about, you basically have the, the different hash rate distributions. This pool has X hash power. This pool has another version, uh, amount of hash power. If they... If, this, if these organizations were actively flaunting the law, one of the things they could do, instead of hiding, is just not claim those blocks. So there's nothing innate in Bitcoin which specifically ties a, a miner to their block. The miners yeah. are basically doing this for marketing purposes at this point. So if they stop doing this, then it would basically just be a big blur of that unknown slice in the, in the charts would get a lot bigger. Yeah. And that might be a good thing because what that means is now it's a lot harder to find the people to go after in order to, for powerful people to exert their will on the miners. Yeah, but well, that's true. But then the hidden other segment could, um, could do things that would be below the radar that uh, may confound the network or, I mean, who knows what. You know? If they were influenced, you wouldn't know that they were being influenced and by whom. Well, you don't know that today. That's true. Yeah. So this is this is just the the general version of of ASIC boost the the uh, the overt version, uh, and this is 
not terribly controversial beside beyond the oh shoot now everyone's gonna have to update and and pay these licensing fees uh, if it becomes a thing yeah but do you think with you know it's happening all over the world I mean do you think that you know let's say Timo goes on a rampage and he wants to enforce this patent and get his fees I mean I would say probably good luck going to a lot of these governments thinking to get out of here you know very possible and you need a lot of power and a lot of money to even enforce it so right some of the fear is that the enforcement will happen at the fabric at the uh, at the foundries mm. but those tend to be fairly secret secretive operations in and of themselves the fact that it's a foundry is not secret but their customers and their designs and things like that right. are not really public so mm. too early too early to say okay. um So there is some historical precedent for this though. So Hollywood is in California for a reason. Uh movies are filmed in California for a reason. And it has nothing to do with the good weather. Well, more, more maybe than maybe a little bit, but Austin they're filming too, but not even good. Uh my reading of history is it has to do with the legal and the patent system. So the uh the Ninth Circuit Court, which is uh uh court of appeals which is headquartered in San Francisco was hesitant to enforce the um Thomas Edison patent on filmmaking hmm. and basically what that meant is all these filmmakers in New York would have to pay all these licensing fees to Thomas Edison but if they just took a trip out to uh to California they wouldn't have to And so now to this day uh film filming is prim- predominantly done in California. Interesting. Yeah. Uh so a similar thing might happen where various jurisdictions may choose not to enforce this patent or may find some prior art or who knows what. Uh where now you've got jurisdictional arbitrage where you can do certain things in certain jurisdictions. It's hard to tell what the future uh chose the different kind of invisible hand yeah hmm. um so all along we've been talking about the um the overt version so the secret covert version <clears throat> is what got has gotten most people up in arms okay so i will um pale in comparison to the explanations that andrea santonopolis gives uh he just gave a let's talk bitcoin uh podcast about basic boost uh and it was very well done and um you'll gain a heck of a lot better understanding about it than listening to me okay um if you want to look at some pretty pictures uh Jeremy Rubin put out a paper a couple days ago about um how the merkel trees are moved around and how the different parts of the hash function are uh either performed or not performed and uh Jimmy Song I uh, also put out a uh, podcast talking uh, about some more explanations about this that uh that, that was pretty good. So if you want to know about the technical aspects of it, go to those resources. Okay, great. Um but I'll basically skip to the end and talk about the implications. So you were talking about the the Merkle tree and different ordering of transactions. So there are two scary things. Uh the first thing is done in a certain way it in order to efficiently do a uh covert asic boost it makes sense to create smaller blocks. It's in the miners economic incentive. So let's uh, let, let, let's do a little bit of a technical uh talk a little bit of technicals about the um uh covert asic boost then. Um so covert asic boost actually requires two mining phases. So the first mining phase uh is quickly and reorders puts a lot of hash power and uses a lot of memory to reorder transactions in a certain way in order to make um to affect certain parts of the merkle root of the uh of the the, the blockchain. Okay. Um and that's part of the efficiency of the, block of the mining. No. Okay. So this initial phase of mining is way easier to do than the uh than the main phase of mining, but it's still a non-trivial operation. 
And it also makes it such that none of the mining pools as they stand today can work with this because it requires, uh, Jimmy Song estimated it required about 256 megabytes of fast memory in order to start doing this this first mining phase. So with, with most things in engineering, there you have trade-offs. And so the covert ASIC boost kind of trades off doing more processing for less processing by adding more memory. Right. And so there are a lot of things in computer science where you have this memory versus processing trade-off. And you could kind of say that this is one of those trade-offs. But what it does is it makes it such that um, it, it disrupts uh, some of the mining pool. So th it may be a bad thing by making it more difficult to set up a mining pool if you need to have these two phases of, of mining. Okay. Where in the, in the past, to set up a mining pool, you just make an API call to Bitcoin Core, and then you get a, a block template, and then you just do the, the hashing operations on that. I'm simplifying this a little bit, but... Um, that API call is not going to be as easy anymore since instead of this API call, you need to do this lightweight mining operation Okay. to properly set it up in the first place. Well, traditional mining operations may have to partner with a specialized you know, entity or rig that does this. Well, this is, this is what a, a mining pool basically is. It's the, the specialized entity which does all the transaction selection, all the ordering, figuring out network policy, and then borrowing hash power from people who are running mining equipment. So my point was, you could probably still do this. It would just have to be uh, done a little bit differently. Um, mm -hmm. It may not be as, as easy. And probably also require hardware to be upgraded. So one of, the, one of the problems that we have now is all these ASIC miners, all these um, equipment that's out there is not set up for this. Mm -hmm. So the, the main crux of the issue... This might actually be the reason why the fighting has been so fierce for the past year or two. What, over SegWit? Covert, over SegWit, and why there's been an incredible amount of resistance to it. Really? Because why? Well, what would happen if, if SegWit was activated? What it would, would basically make covert ASIC boost not workable. Really? Yeah. So this may actually force SegWit adoption and maybe a gun to the head of the mining industry? Well, so I find you should put it that way. So the, the mining industry is kind of a, a, a cartel, their, their own group. And a large faction of them probably aren't doing this ASIC boost. So right now, if, um, if the miner, if um, Bitmain on their, uh, in their Bitmain pool is doing the, uh, this ASIC boost which is hard to prove one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So we should probably led, have led with this. A lot of these uh, allegations are uns unsubstantiated. Right. I know. But even if they're not doing this, all lots of things point to, uh, to them doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, Bitmain is doing a, uh, a marketing opportunity, uh, marketing uh, program where they're putting head-to-head... Uh, -head Cloud mining in China versus uh, mining locally, hmm. and eventually, will uh, the results of the um, of this head-to-head -head operation will be uh, which is better, cloud mining in China or mining yourself? And if it turns out that mining in China is twenty or thirty percent more efficient, then instead of thinking, hmm, maybe they ran their operations better, or maybe they got cheaper electricity, now it's Hey, did you do this trick? Were they juicing? Were they, they, were they roiding they, on uh, uh, that's, that's a good. That's a good analogy. It's a good analogy because basically it's, it's talking about a level playing field. And mm -hmm. if you're using steroids, the other players in the sport, they could all take the steroids themselves and then level up to that. Or they could pretty much make a rule that says, hey, you're not allowed to do steroids. Right. Yeah. Definitely. To relevel the hmm. playing field. So back to the, the mining as an industry. Right now they've got, um, presumably, it's, it, it's a, a very small, um, well, let's say a minority, of the hash power which is actually doing this. 
And if the other miners are basically losing out in their perception by allowing a minority to have an unfair advantage in, in their minds, that they can, like steroids, uh, say, we don't want to do this as, a, as an industry, they can activate SegWit, or there's another feature in there that is not the full SegWit, but would effectively uh, have the same stopping of the covert uh, mining. Yeah, because this is kind of crazy. Now it's, um, it's put things at a, um, at a decision point. You know, if SegWit doesn't get signaled enough and doesn't go live, and, you know, this uh, ASIC boost becomes prevalent amongst a whole bunch of miners, they're never going to want SegWit because it takes away, you know, it takes it away. Or I guess it relevels the field. And this is the scary part, where if covert ASIC boost becomes accepted as the norm, this pretty much calcifies Bitcoin and will stop further advancement. Maybe a little bit with uh, just straight bigger blocks, but this uh, they can they could keep doing it with straight bigger blocks. But none of the revolutionary features that are coming down the pipeline. Segwit might be able to be redesigned to allow this type of thing, but if you're doing that, you're basically the miners are conceding that now anyone who doesn't have anyone who is going is not going to do ASIC boost is, is losing at this point. Yeah. Well, you said that, um, you know, obviously, you know, no one knows for sure if Bitmain was doing this, but there seems to be evidence that they were. So if someone's full on doing the ASIC boost, how strong of a signal does that send that can be analyzed? Well, you know, I mean, even though you say it's covert or it's called that, if someone's, you know, if a pool is full on doing it, will people know? Or can they truly do it in a covert way and you're not sure? I mean, wouldn't wouldn't they start to get an outsized uh, percentage of the blocks over time? There's more and more and more of them. And you'd, it would send a signal saying, hey, what's going on here? Sure, yeah, they'd, they'd be more profitable than their competitors. But like significantly more. Perhaps, yeah. I don't know for sure. I know people have looked into it and tried to do analysis and haven't really found too much in the way of evidence. But that's the thing about it. If you do it right then there's not much evidence to be found. So this is like a governance problem. What's going to happen? Who has the voice? Who has the power to move this thing in a given direction? That's a good question. Hmm. That's a good question. As if poor Bitcoin didn't have enough troubles. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the, what, what the, the big bombshell is, is if this, the, the, the largest mining equipment provider has been actively stopping advancement of the protocol due to selfish interests to maintain their own advantage, then why th this is to me seems like a perverse incentive where it's th the miner's interest is to stagnate and everyone mm -hmm. else's interest is to move forward <clears throat> only to make them to make them a few more tens of millions of dollars. It's a a motive that's played out for thousands of years, you know, same motive. So yeah, we're pretty young in, into Bitcoin's life and hmm. we're seeing uh, stagnation as a, um, which I mean, in kind of the way Bitcoin was set up is to make it difficult to change. So this kind of reinforces that or is a manifestation of this. Yeah. I mean, you could, <clears throat> this, all kinds of things could happen. This could accelerate, you know, Litecoin's adoption of SegWit. I mean, it could do 20 different things from here. Who knows where it's going to go? And, and here's the thing, no sane developer is, um, that I've met is truly advocating to, to keep the block size the same forever. It, it's all a matter of timing. And so there are basically, the way I, um, I've heard it put is there are two, two schools of thought. The first one is that Bitcoin needs to stay small, it needs to stay underground on a technical level until society no longer fears Bitcoin, um, at which point after society no longer fears it, then, um, and it's no longer, and it has survived technical attacks up to that point, then the blocks can expand arbitrarily large. And at that point, it will be different communities going back to the, uh, to the different nations competing with each other over governance. But the fact of Bitcoin being a threat to them to those communities is, is no longer, it, it would be the other communities that are a threat to them, not Bitcoin itself. Yeah. And then 
there, there's the other camp where they're trying to accelerate this elimination of the threat to society by spreading Bitcoin to as many people as possible to bring it into their daily lives. You know, like Abra and these, these services where mm-hmm. Bitcoin is in the background, in the, in the back room locked away. But you know. mm-hmm. And so the defense is to get as many Bitcoiners as possible, as quickly as possible, to, to make it such that uh, tax won't, uh, won't come fast enough. Well, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> the story is even more convoluted than anyone ever imagined. Huh. All right. Well, any um, any other points that you wanted to bring up, or? You know? Um, no, I think that's uh, that's that's all I've got. I, mean, right. I don't know if uh, we're getting towards the end here. So. Yeah. Well, for listeners, see, I told you this is going to be interesting, and that it's a good reason to talk to Brian. So, Brian, thanks so much for giving all your knowledge, and uh, I think it's rare that people are going to find this this level of detail anywhere else. So, thanks for coming. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at uh, Deary Me. Uh, Deary underscore me. And Deary is D-E-E-R-Y? That's the one. Okay. All right, Brian, thanks a lot. All right, thank you. You've been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, both to review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.